Hey guys, it's Medical Sense Perfect Sense, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's resume our biochemistry playlist for MCAT, DAT, and NEAT. In previous videos, we talked about amino acids and their structure. We talked about the titration of amino acids and the peptide bonds. Today, it's time to talk about the protein structure. From simple to complex, let's go. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and then quaternary structure. The primary protein structure is just a sequence of amino acids. How about the secondary structure? This is number two, because secondary has two types, the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. Next is the tertiary, which is the three-dimensional shape of the protein. And last is the quaternary structure. By the way, not every protein has this. You gotta have at least two or more peptide chains to have it. Example is the hemoglobin because it has two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. That's a quaternary structure. Also antibodies, they have two light chains and two heavy chains a quaternary structure. This is my biochemistry playlist. Please watch these videos in order. And please watch this playlist after finishing the biology playlist first. Biology is so easy, much easier than chemistry or biochemistry. So if I were you, I'll start with biology as early as possible so that I can focus on chemistry next while doing biology question in review. And because we will use lots of biology info to understand biochemistry. You don't believe me? Consider this, the cell membrane. Remember the hydrophilic head, hydrophobic tail. And why is that? Because there is water on the outside and water on the inside of the cell. So I'll put the hydrophilic towards the water on the outside and on the inside. How about the lipid who hates water? I will bury the fat in the middle. And that's why you need a bilayer because there is water outside and there is water inside and the fat is always buried in the center. That's why your cell membrane is like an amphibian. It's amphipathic. Five minutes from now, we will use the same concept in the tertiary structure of protein. Next, recall that your diet is carbs, proteins, and fat. Proteins become polypeptides and then oligopeptides, dipeptides, and then amino acids, which is just a monopeptide. How about fat or lipid? They start with triglycerides, that's the big fat. Then they become glycerol and free fatty acids. How to absorb anything that is not fat, i.e. not lipid soluble, i.e. water soluble, easy, into blood vessels, arteries, and veins. But what if I want to absorb fat? Oh, oh, that's a different story. To absorb fat, you need three organs to be robust. One, liver and biliary system. Two, pancreas. Three, the bowel or the intestine, which will do the actual absorption. When you absorb fat, you do not go into blood vessels. Instead, you go into lymph vessels, such as these wonderful lacteals in the villi of your intestine. And look at this, you bury your fat in the middle and you put the water soluble stuff on the outside. You know why? Because there is water on the outside, everywhere. What's the name of the wonderful structure that made this organization? Thank you, bile salts, for making those micelles. Then you package me into chylomicrons, send me to the lacteal, which will send me to the lymphatic vessels, which will eventually send me to thoracic duct on the left or right lymphatic duct on the right side. Eventually, both will end up into big veins, which will take us to the right atrium of the heart. This concept of hiding the fat on the inside while leaving the water soluble on the outside is going to be used again five minutes from now when we talk about the tertiary structure of proteins. Now please get your gluteus maximus off the couch and draw this with me using pen and paper. Let's draw the structure of the amino acid. You start with a carbon. Amazing. This is called the alpha carbon. And then left versus right. Remind me please, what are we trying to draw? Amino acids. Say it again because it was so beautiful. Amino acid. Correct. Amino acid. So you start with amino on the left side and you go with the acid on the right side. Recall from chemistry that carbon requires four bonds. Here is one, here is two. All right, the third one is attached to an R group, which could be anything. And the last one is simply hydrogen. This is the structure of your amino acid. Easy peasy. 
pause and review. Since we say amino before the acid, since A comes before C, you start with the amino and then the acid. This order matters. Who determines the chemical properties of the amino acid? The R group, the side chain. This is the alpha carbon, unless you're GABA, where your amino group is bound to that gamma carbon. That's why we call it GABA, because it stands for gamma amino butyric acid, as we have discussed in previous videos in this biochemistry playlist. And when I say that you start with the amino and then you follow it by the acid, this is not an arbitrary order. It's not a quote, social construct, unquote. It's actually how the ribosome makes the amino acid. The ribosome itself starts with the N terminus and ends with the C terminus. If I lump a group of amino acids together, congratulations, you have peptides. Lump those peptides together, you get proteins. Are all of the amino acids in the body incorporated into proteins? No, only the 20 proteogenic famous amino acids are the ones incorporated into proteins and the ones coded by your DNA. Each one has a name, a one-letter abbreviation, and a three-letter abbreviation. Pause and review. And again, what kind of peptides are you talking about? Could be dipeptides if you're made of two amino acids. Tripeptides, three amino acids. Oligopeptides, four to twenty. Polypeptides, more than twenty. But what's the monopeptide then? That's just one amino acid, doofus. Pause and review. So there you go, here's your amino acid, and then lump two together, dipeptides, and then tripeptides, oligopeptides, polypeptides, and then proteins. But how do you lump them together? By forming a peptide bond. You see the carboxyl group of this amino acid, and the amino group of the next amino acid? Let's remove the OH from the first, and the H from the second, to make water, and what's left? is gonna make a peptide bond, also known as amide bond, giving you this functional group right here. Because this reaction yielded water, you can call this a dehydration reaction. Now you're ready to understand the protein structure. Proteins are made of many amino acids, as you know. All enzymes of your body are proteins, all channels, proteins, all carriers are proteins, all receptors are proteins, all pumps are proteins, some hormones are proteins, the others are fat. But hey, medicosis, I know like about an RNA inside the cell that acts as an enzyme, but it's not a protein. I know, doofus, there are exceptions. We're trying to keep it simple over here. If you want to confuse yourself, go listen to your professor. Enough with these dead jokes. Protein structure from the simple to the more complex. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. They are color-coded in my lecture. And you can always download these notes at metacosisperfectionetics.com. By the end of the video, you should be able to fill in this table. I'll show you how to do it at the end, but just watch the video and try to fill in the gaps. It will be better for you if you can do it yourself. Primary protein structure. What the flip is that? It's just the sequence of amino acids. That's it? Yeah. Hey, medicosis, does it matter that aspartate comes after valine, not valine after aspartate? Yes, of course it matters. It's about the sequence, dude. This is important. How about the secondary protein structure? Just remember number two, because we have two patterns here the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets, which are nothing more but arrangement with the neighboring amino acids to give you these recurrent structural patterns. Hint, the alpha helix rotates clockwise. Third, tertiary protein structure. Just remember number three for 3D, three-dimensional folding. And please try to keep this in mind because in a later video we'll talk about protein denaturation and I will remind you that protein denaturation is the exact opposite of the tertiary structure. In tertiary structure, we're trying to fold the protein, but in denaturation, we're trying to unfold it. Integration, disintegration. The one in the many versus the many without the one. That was deep. Last, quaternary structure. Not every protein has a quaternary structure. If you want a quaternary structure, you gotta have at least two polypeptides. You can have two or more. You can have a hundred if you want. And these are arranged in space. Example, hemoglobin, two alpha chains and two beta chains, mnemonic. 
2 plus 2 equals 4. How about this? This is the antibody, also known as aminoglobulin, which is a gamma globulin, if you remember your biology. This aminoglobulin has two light chains and two heavy chains. Mnemonic, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Quaternary structure. Let's take it to the next level. Primary protein structure. What's that? Sequence of amino acid. What's the name of the bond that's keeping them in place? Covalent bonds. Mostly peptide bonds, but could be disulfide as well. Sulfur and sulfur. On your exam day, peptide bonds are more important for the primary structure, while the disulfide bonds are more important in the tertiary structure. Next, secondary. Two for two. Two types such as the alpha helix, remember the clockwise, and the beta pleated sheets could be parallel or anti-parallel. What's keeping them in place? Hydrogen bond between what? Between the oxygen of the carbonyl group and the hydrogen of the amide group. Between the oxygen and the hydrogen will have a hydrogen bond. Next, tertiary structure. Remember for three, the 3D. And this depends on three things hydrogen bond, disulfide bond, and salt bridges. Not to be confused with your three-dimensional yoga bridges. Last, quaternary structure. 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 alpha chains and 2 beta chains in hemoglobin, and 2 light chains, 2 heavy chains of the immunoglobulin. The quaternary structure has, guess what, four functions, as we'll discuss soon. Let's dig even deeper. Primary structure. What's that? Linear arrangement of the amino acid. The sequence matters. The order matters. Since this is all the info, this encodes for all the info that you need for folding at subsequent higher structures, i.e. you need this sequence for the next secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures that will come later. Sequence of amino acid is the structure which determines the function of the protein. No kidding. How can I detect the sequence? Many techniques in biochemistry. Here is the crown jewel, mass spectrometry. And of course, any technique that is trying to establish the sequence will be called uh, uh, sequencing. What's keeping you in check? Covalent bond, mostly peptide bond between this amino acid and the following amino acid, between one amino acid and the next amino acid. Number two, secondary structure, which has two patterns, alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. What's keeping you in check? Hydrogen bond between two groups. Carbonyl group, I need your oxygen. Amide group, I need your hydrogen. Boom, you have a hydrogen bond. Just like the one you have in water. Guys, by the way, I think I'm being poisoned because my tap water or my faucet water is contaminated with a poison. You know what the name of the poison is? Dihydrogen monoxide. Please, if I pass away, call the cops because I'm in grave danger. Did you believe me, you freaking doofus? Dihydrogen monoxide is just what? Classic dad joke. Why is anybody watching my videos? The two types of the secondary structure, remember two with two. Alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. Give me an example of each. Alpha helix is like an alpha keratin, which is found in your hair, skin, etc. How about the beta pleated sheets? Fibroin, which is found in silk. Why does silk have a pattern? Because it's a beta pleated sheet. Note, proline is weird. If you put proline in the middle of the alpha helix or in the middle of the beta sheet, it will make a kink and will destroy the whole thing. Therefore, proline will not exist in the center. Proline will exist at the beginning or at the start of the alpha helix or at the turn of the beta pleated sheet, but not in the middle. Next to the tertiary structure. Have you ever wondered why proteins exist as fibrous proteins or globular proteins? Fibrous proteins include what? Collagen and elastin fibers. How about globular proteins? Oh, something like globulin, if you remember your biology. Or globin, also globular. Globin, myoglobin, etc. Do you remember albumin and globulin, the plasma proteins? Globulin is also globular. Now, do you know why proteins are either fibrous or globular? It's thanks to their tertiary and quaternary structure. Which one is more important? tertiary structure because this is the three-dimensional shape of the protein. 
Tertiary structure, let's go. Three, three-dimensional. What keeps you in check? Three forces. Number one, hydrogen bond. Two, salt bridges. Three, disulfide bond. Let's start with hydrogen bond. Remember the cell membrane. Put the water soluble on the outside and on the inside and bury the hydrophobic, the fat, in the middle. Just like this. Fat is in the middle, surrounded by water. Hydrophobic in the middle, surrounded by hydrophilic. This water is forming a shell, known as the solvation layer. Why? Because water is a solvent. Oh, so the solvation layer is water. Yes. Suppose that this was just water-soluble stuff. Do you think we'll have lipid or fat in the middle? No. Do you think we'll have a shell around it? No, there is nothing to surround. There is no fat to be around. Thank you. Therefore, this beauty must shape depends on the availability of the fat in the middle. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That's why we call them hydrophobic interactions. It's the presence of these hydrophobic residues that give the protein its beauty mass. 3D structure. Let's review some general chemistry. Water is the solvent, and if you are water soluble, you are polar, you are charged, you are hydrophilic. Conversely, if you're fat, you're nonpolar, uncharged, hydrophobic. Let's dig deeper. The more water soluble stuff you have, the less the solvation layer. Why? Because the solvation layer is basically made as a shell to surround the fat. If you have no fat or less fat, you'll have less shell to surround the fat. Duh! Because there is nothing to surround. Okay, I got you. And then when you decrease the solvation layer, you'll increase entropy. We call this a positive change in entropy. What's entropy? Entropy is a lazy butt who's going to hell. For example, when the tea is hot, okay, that's an active state. And then as you leave it alone, it's gonna go back to the room temperature. Going back is a lazy butt process known as entropy. Conversely, ice melts. As ice melts, it's going towards entropy. So entropy is a spontaneous process and it's favorable because it requires less energy or no energy. Conversely, by adding more fat in the middle, you will force the water around it to make a shell. The solvation layer will increase, decreasing entropy, i.e. a negative change in entropy. Because there is less entropy, this is non-spontaneous, unlike the first one. And the non-spontaneous is non-favorable. Why? Because it requires energy. And its delta G is greater than zero, if you remember your chemistry. That was number one, hydrophilic hydrophobic interactions. Number two, salt bridges, yoga bridges, right leg, left leg, positive ion, negative ion, cation versus anion, or acid versus base. I mean, look at the charge. Even acid base have charges. But then when you lump the sodium and the chloride together, look at this. You get sodium chloride without the charges. Same thing happens to the proteins. Some of those lovely amino acids are positively charged, others are negatively charged, and before you know it, they interact with each other, forming an ion pair, a salt bridge. And the crazy mnemonic again, yoga bridges are 3D in shape. Why do you wear 3D yoga bridges to show your curves and curls? Curls? Curly? Why am I curly? Disulfide bonds. The more disulfide bonds you have, the greater the, quote, curliness. They make loop in the protein structure. What's a disulfide bond? It's a bond between sulfur and the next sulfur. Example, adding cysteine to cysteine. Amino acids will give you cysteine. This is a disulfide bond. This is an oxidation reaction. Why is it oxidation reaction? Because you lost the electrons. Electrons are negative. When you lose a negative, it's oxidation. Lost quaternary structure. Not in every protein. In order to have a quaternary structure, you need to possess two or more polypeptides arranged in space. They aggregate to form these lovely shapes, such as the hemoglobin with two alpha chains and two beta chains, or the immunoglobulin with two heavy chains and two light chains. Why do we need quaternary structure? Because they serve four functions. Just remember that I have three arrows going down and three arrows going up. Let's go. Look at this. Oh, folding and wrapping and entangling it on top of each other will decrease the surface area. 
of course. Conversely, if I unwrap it, if I make it linear, I will raise the surface area. But when I wrap it like this, it's going to lower the surface area, which makes it more stable, by the way, because now not every doofus can come and break it apart. This is a wonderfully integrated structure. Next, it decreased the amount of DNA needed to code for the protein. Well, no kidding, because it decreased the protein surface area. Duh! When I wrap it like this, now this part came closer to this part. Oh, that's gonna be easier for us, because you decrease the distance between the catalytic sites, bringing catalytic sites close together, giving you a faster reaction with higher speeds. Last, the increased cooperativity or allosteric effects. We'll talk about that later, but for now, just remember, it means change in one subunit will cause a change in the next subunit. It could be an activation, we call this an allosteric activator, or it could be inhibition, allosteric inhibitor. There are many doofus pharmacology students who just read the words allosteric activator and allosteric inhibitor without having any idea of what the flip they're talking about. So let's review. Primary protein structure is the sequence of amino acids depending on the covalent bonds, particularly the peptide bonds. The secondary structure has two types, alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. Who keeps you in check? Hydrogen bonds between the oxygen of the carbonyl and the hydrogen of the amide group. Tertiary, 3D structure and depends on three things. Hydrogen bond, hydrophilic outside, hydrophilic inside, hydrophobic in the center, disulfide bonds, and the salt bridges. Fourth, quaternary structure. 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 alpha and 2 beta of hemoglobin, 2 light and 2 heavy chains of the immunoglobulin, and it serves 4 functions. And now you're ready to fill in the table. Do you have any problems with this? Let me know in the comment section. But other than that, the table is just beautimous. If you want to be an excellent student, bring a blank piece of paper and write everything down. Better if you can do it from memory without looking at this. If you like this video, you'll enjoy my toxicology course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. I also have a general pharmacology course and an acid-base imbalance course for medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students, etc. In the next video, we'll talk about conjugated proteins and denaturation. Until then, please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.